so you think I tricked you, right? <laughs> said, Let's talk about the Antichrist. And I'm like, no, I'm going to talk about me and my, my, my consternation and my deep thoughts. Uh, well, I, it, was, it was all an introduction. It was an introduction because, because what would the Antichrist do? Is he would trick you. That's exactly. What he would do, right. And so I, it was like a symbolic gesture of, of uh, semi, uh, what, what do they call that? Um, uh, uh, not modern art. What do you do? Performance art. It was performance art. <laughs> I, I should have guessed at that. I'm surprised I didn't recognize oh. it when I saw it. I hinted at. Now, by the way, Brian Wolfman is here with me this week again. We're going to continue the eschatology series, Wolf's eschatology series, whatever we want to call it. And and we're, we've been moving our way. It's been a while, really, since we've done this. We've moved our way through the question of Antichrist. Because if you're going to talk about the end of the world, that's something you have to deal with. And there are three previous episodes dealing with this. Uh, Antichrist as, like, who is it? Where do you find him? Um, the man of lawlessness. And, uh, and then also the Beasts of Revelation. Those are in the Revelation series. Uh, you can find those all at revfisk.com, which costs less than wolfmuller.com, which is crazy to me. I don't know how that happened. <laughs> Did that one? <laughs> what? It was $18 for the year. That's how useless RevFisk is. It's unbelievable. Wow, surprised. I should have snatched that up. I could have Should've. sold it to you for 25 bucks at least. Yeah, made some money. But I, so, so there's there's previous episodes in this section, and then there's more on the end of the world series. So we're we're gonna keep going with these, uh, even though I've been distracted from it for a bit. The I hinted at uh, when we had our other conversation last week, two weeks ago, that I'd run into this uh, trend. There's another term from tradcath. Is that what they call them? Trad tradcaths, uh, traditional Catholic Trentine Latin Mass wow. Roman Catholic guy. Wow. Really intelligent, good guy. I liked him. We got along really well, uh, you know, for a guy who worships the Antichrist and, and, and me. <laughs> and it was funny as we were, we were talking about the end of Western civilization and the challenges that the church has faced and all this, but it only took us maybe seven minutes to get to justification. It really didn't take that long. But before we got there, we were at the Pope and, and what the Pope has to do with, well, the church. And what was so interesting to me was he made the case that the current Pope, so-called Francis, is not in fact Pope. <laughs> he is a false Pope. And in order to prove this, <laughs> he used great. Pope doctrine of what the um, uh, the canon law is for the resignment of a Pope. And, and the short story is – that Benedict's resignation was not valid. So he's still technically Pope and that he was forced out, which is illegal according to their rules. And so then uh, you have this, this infiltrator in Francis there. And I found it doubly interesting that in order to preserve the doctrine of the Pope, they had to then make use of the doctrine of the Pope. Like the, <laughs> it, was, it was just so interesting to me. What, like, like you couldn't use the Bible to do what, this, right? Was Benedict infallible when he resigned? This is the thing. <laughs> no, because he was forced into resignation. So, so like the the internal work is this has to do with the the fuchsia mafia. Yeah, that all the it. lavender palace and all that. The stuff. lavender mafia, yeah, right. all that stuff that's going on inside. Uh, and so he he was not infallible because it was not ex cathedra. Because to be ex cathedra, it has to be in unity with I think the cardinals. I don't know, but he was he was not wanting to do it. He was pressured. It was political pressure, maybe even maybe even physical pressure. I don't know. Who knows. Um, and so, and so the long and short is the Pope's not the Pope, but the, the real Pope is the, – what got me was, man, this just shows you how central to your belief, your church, you are the church. Because some of this came out of like, how can you say Roman Catholicism is the one true church? Look at Francis. Like that's sort of what I was saying. Like, ha ha, <laughs> you know, it's funny for me as a Lutheran. And then he went into this. He, he defended it. He you had to defend. To defend oh, no, that's not right. really the Pope. The real Pope's this other guy who's faithful, right? So so – what do you think about that? I mean, you got to have more thoughts on that than I can because you're more. Ver no, no, it's um, right. It is. It is important for us to realize. I mean, we don't think that this could possibly be true, that the article upon which the Catholic Church stands or falls is the article of the Pope. That is this that that, that you know the Catholic Church is always talking about how Protestants are divided and we're united and their unity is a symbol of the of their truth. Uh, that they are the true church and so forth, but their unity is the Pope. He, they, they say that he is the unity of the church. So, um, that it's everything. It, the, 
everything revolves around the doctrine of the Pope for the Catholic. And, and they, they admit that. It's not like they try to hide that from you and say, no, no, we really believe the Bible, but the Pope is just one of the doc. No, they'll just, they're out, they'll say it, that the, that the Pope is the visible form of unity of the church, that he is, he is the vicar of Christ on earth, that he is the head of the church, that he has supreme authority to rule the world. This is all in, in hidden in plain sight. And so, that is the thing that matters for them. I mean, the thing that'll get you in trouble if you're talking to a Lutheran, for example, is if you if you don't have the gospel. But the thing that gets you in trouble with the Catholics is when you talk about the Pope. I find like I feel like it's hard for modern Lutherans to even wrap our heads around how serious that is. It's almost like, oh, that's that's a cute heresy. As, you know, don't chant. Whatever you do, don't chant. But um, yeah, you know, my friend, they they go to the Catholic Church. It's okay. It's it's their thing. It's what they do. And yet, you go back what even a hundred years, and it's not like you're supposed to hate your Catholic neighbors. They're good people. And it's not even like you're supposed to hate the man who is the Pope necessarily. But it it's like well, what they say is, this is the Antichrist. Like. You know, drop mic, drop bomb. I don't know. Uh, wow, that's intense. Well, that escalated quickly. Well, you know, <laughs> I that is it's so the this has been the Lutheran understanding from the very get go, and you can see it develop in Luther. You can like some uh, someone tracked this down for me one time, and I was looking. It's really interesting. You can see the the idea that the Pope is the Antichrist develop in Luther's writing really early. So there's a letter where he says. He says, I'm trying to figure out if the Pope is the Antichrist or just one of the minions of the Antichrist. And then like three months later, he writes a letter. He's like, nah, he's the Antichrist. <laughs> so you so you could see the transition because when, when the Reformation started and Luther wrote, for example, the 95 Theses, he dedicated it to the Pope. He thought the Pope was, was still a, a godly, it was a godly office in the church and that people were abusing his name and doing illicit things under the name of the Pope. And so he was writing to defend the, in fact, the 95 Theses and the, and even the explanation of it was written to defend the honor of the Pope. He wasn't in on how deep the corruption went, but when that started to unfold, when, when the gospel was opposed at every level of the church, and when the teaching of the scripture was opposed at every level of the Catholic church, then, then that antichrist, um, that that office of Antichrist and that work of Antichrist started to reveal itself. Um, but you're right. When we say, hey, the Lutherans say the Pope's the Antichrist, everyone's like, whoa, that that's mean. But here's been the here's been the easiest way that I've <laughs> that I've convinced people. Because you know, in Bible class, it's one of those questions that you get. It's like one of the three or four bear trap questions that every pastor is tempted to step into. Like when you walk into class and people are like, hey, pastor. What do you think about Billy Graham? <laughs> this is like I could see that coming. But this is this. Do we really say the Pope's the Antichrist? It's like a trick question. So what I did one time is I went and I collected all the things that the Pope says about himself and just put it together in this document. You can find we'll put maybe we can put the link in the show notes. Is that a thing? And I'll try to and do that. um and you could just it's and I started with Unum Sanctum, and that's the main one, but I went all the way through. There's a little bit from some other papal bulls and then Vatican I especially and Vatican II and the Catechism of the Catholic Church, just to see what the Pope says about himself. And when you read this, I'll, I'll, I'll hand it out to Bible class and we'll read a few paragraphs and people are like, this guy's the Antichrist. <laughs> <laughs> it's the best way to prove the point is just to see what how the Pope talks about himself and what the Catholic Church says about the Pope. And once you see what they actually say and believe, then it starts to really come clear. What's interesting is how the modern Catholic doesn't maybe know this and, and even how the modern Catholic church has, they don't hide from it and yet they don't shout it either. It, it's sort of like a, it's like a smoke screen kind of going on above this thing. So we're going to look at this document a little bit here. And then um, we're also going to look at another document called the treatise on the power and the primacy of the Pope which is written by Philip Melanchthon and it's part of your Lutheran confessions. If you're, if you're a Lutheran little known document, really easy to read, and frankly, important. well written and very important. I agree. What we're going to be doing though, is building upon the foundation of those other three episodes I mentioned earlier about the idea of antichrist, because if you hear 
Luther's saying, I think this guy's the Antichrist. And you hear it as some semi-incarnate son of the devil who will come at the end of time, right before the very end of the world. You're going to be like, yep, Luther was crazy because right. obviously the world didn't end and there's all this, you know, the, the millennium hasn't come. So, so, well, that's not what Antichrist means in right. the Bible. And, and and we've we've developed that in those other three episodes. So we're not going to redo the entire thing. You'd have to go listen to those. But just know that's – so we're working from this idea that the end times Antichrist does not mean a single man who comes right before the end of the world. It means the existence of an Antichrist throughout the end times, which are from the rise of – Pentecost, right? The rise of the church until Christ returns. And the main definition of this is going to be one who takes his seat in the church, but claims the power of salvation over and apart from Christ. Right. Am I, am yeah. I getting that right as a yeah, summary? Exactly. I mean, that, that's what the Antichrist means. So for whatever reason, you know, we read like the book of Revelation and this sort, and we hear these things and we, th and we, our imagination goes to like scenes from Ghostbusters. <laughs> It's yeah. wrong. That's not that's that's wrong. So whenever you get a Ghostbuster scene in your imagination, thinking about the Antichrist, just know that you're not seeing things like the Bible pictures it because because the Antichrist, especially in the text from Paul in Thessalonians, he's going to say he presents himself in the church so that there's an angel of light aspect to the Antichrist. There's a clothed in in sheep's clothing, maybe more than anybody else. The Antichrist is going to be this deceiver. So. So we don't expect to see this like ghostly beast with horns, you know, like coming out of the it's darkness. It's so interesting how the modern rapturists all want to paint the Antichrist as a, a, how much is it, of this is a reflection of the church growth movement. I don't know. As like this, this politician in a suit, right? Uh, kind of winning the world with his suave power. But the, the biblical image is that of a, the ultimate pastor, mm -hmm. the ultimate mm -hmm. priest, right? The one who is the most holy and sanctified, not some businessman with like tanks, but a, a guy who, well, frankly, actually gets power over the entire church in the world. And this is where Luther's gonna gonna go, right? Where he's gonna go on this. So okay. Do you want to start with the treatise or you want to start with I want to start uh, with Unum Sanctum because okay. this is the this gives okay. us the background. So the so maybe just as so the treatise is going to be saying the Pope is says three things about himself and those three things are wrong. He says that uh oh here's the, what's the list? The last one is that it's necessary for salvation that he has all authority by divine right. That's the first one. The second one is that he has the power of both swords. That's both temporal and uh, and spiritual authority. And then the third thing that the Pope says is that it's necessary for salvation to believe these things. So so the treatise is going to argue those three points, but it's those three points are probably most clearly articulated in this papal bull called Unum Sanctum, which was from 1302, November 18th, 1302. And so to understand what the Lutherans are fighting against, you got to understand what the Catholics were saying. So that, so that's, I think, the place can, to start. Can you, can you explain why it's called a bull? No. Because it doesn't have horns. No, what does can't. it mean? It just means like document. Why? I don't know. It's got to be some Latin word. I, Papal bull. It just sounds, it sounds like, what was it? The, uh, there was this famous uh, bull in Egypt that uh, one of the, one of the children of, Cyrus the Great or something killed, and it was all this big deal. And this is what it sounds like, right? The holy, the holy bull. So I, I'm going to Google that. Yeah, while I don't you know. Talk. I'd like so, to know actually. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, but so an unum sanctum would have been a. So we know this much that a papal bull is an official statement from the church that is to be taken effectively as ultimate truth, right? Uh, does it establish doctrine? I don't know if it establishes doctrine um, or not. Because uh, they have they have a, a rule for yeah, that. Yeah, I don't know. It's close. It's like as close as you could get. It's a. It's it's even they they don't say it's it's published they say it's promulgated, huh. so this mm. is it's put forth as official thing. Um, now this is Boniface the Eighth who wrote this, and then Unum Sanctum means one, one church. church. Right. So it's an official statement. One church, thirteen o two. What are they? So here, he so here's the start. Urged by faith, we are obliged to believe and maintain that the church is one holy Catholic and also apostolic. We believe in her firmly, and we confess with simplicity that outside of her there is neither salvation nor the remission of sins, 
which is true. As the spouse of the canticle proclaims, one is my dove, my perfect one. She is the only one chosen of her who bore her. And she represents the one sole mystical body whose head is Christ and the head of Christ is God, 1 Corinthians eleven three. In her then is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, Ephesians 4. There had been at the time of the deluge only one ark of Noah prefiguring the one church, which ark having been finished to a single cubit had only one pilot and guide, that is Noah. And we read that outside of this ark, that all all that subsisted on the earth was destroyed. Now, that's good to get the flavor. And so far, so good. I mean, we might argue with the, if you want to argue that the church is one, I'm not sure you would want to go to the Song of Solomon and and to Noah to argue it. But the point stands. <laughs> Great. It's awesome. Why not? Why? Try out the Song of Solomon. Yeah. You just <laughs> why not? If you say, Anybody got any ideas about why the church is one? I was reading Song of Solomon the other day. I bet you were. <laughs> I bet you were. Yeah, Bob, you, uh, your celibacy valves aren't going so well, are they, Bob? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, a bull, I'm going to pause yeah, now. Yeah. A bull comes from Latin bulla, which means seal. It has to do with the, the metal seal that was attached to it with the, the, as a signature of the, uh, or the official office of the Pope, right? So like you would seal a letter, and that's where it comes it's from. Kinda, when you see these in museums, it's kind of cool. They'll be have these huge wax seals. They'll be like six, seven inches across, these big kind of trays or dishes that are tied to the things, and the seal is pressed on it. So, There are two classes of bulls, one of greater and lesser solemnity. The great bulls uh, are in the nature of confirmations of charters, monasteries. Ugh. 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 Papal call for... Uh, <laughs> I'm trying to find like what authority they have. And the answer is kind of a lot, maybe sometimes. Jeez. Anyway. Okay. Let's get back to what they said. It goes on to say that the church is one like the tunic of Jesus. Remember how Jesus had a seamless tunic. It wasn't torn, but it was, it was, they cast lots for it. They didn't tear it in half. So the church is like the seamless tunic. Okay. Now we get into it. Therefore of the one and only church, there is one body and one head not two heads like a monster. Now I want, this is one of the most amazing statements to me. So I want to read it kind of slowly. So you, you I'm going to start over of this one and only church. There is one body and one head, not two heads like a monster. That is Christ and the vicar of Christ, Peter and the successor of Peter. Since the Lord speaking to Peter himself said, feed my sheep. <laughs> so, so did you get that? There's one. He- yeah. I, there's. Yeah. Yeah. So, so what he's saying is there's only one head, Jesus and, and Peter and the Pope. You're like, and you're like, wait, I can count. I was like, okay, one head, Jesus, one Peter, two, the successor of Peter, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Two. This is a, it's not a, what it's not a two headed monster. It's a, it's a, 506 headed monster or whatever is what they make the church out to be or else the only other way to have only one head is that jesus is the head for a little while and then he's decapitated and peter takes his place which is probably the idea of this is probably the idea that they're actually getting after because when they say that the pope is the vicar of christ on earth that he is the Pope oh, takes the pl- Jesus is not earth. So the Pope takes the place of Christ. Yeah. And that's what it means to be the vicar of Christ. To be so that they decapitate the church. Jesus is not the head. Peter is the head. Which is just stunning. I mean, that is okay. So it's so it says, feed my sheep, meaning my sheep in general, not these or those in particular, once we understand that he entrusted all to Peter. Therefore, if the Greeks or others should say that they are not confided to Peter and to his successors, they must confess not being the sheep of Christ. Since our Lord Jesus so says there is one sheepfold and one shepherd. Yeah, so the East, they just said the Eastern Orthodox are not Christians because they are not underneath the authority of Peter, which we Pope has. Right. That was That's that. that. So the Pope has the all divine authority. That's what, Now here's going to go. The next part of this bull talks about both swords. So we talk about the right hand and left hand kingdom. Uh, sometimes casually, you know, you have temporal and spiritual authority. And we say that the state has the left hand kingdom, the left hand sword, the, uh, the authority to kill and so forth. And the church has the right hand authority, the authority of the word of God. 
the Catholic Church is going to claim that the Pope possesses both swords. And this is what it sounds like. And I want you to hear the biblical proof. This is really great. Uh, let's see here. We are informed by the text of the Gospels that in this church and in its power, there are two swords, namely the spiritual and the temporal. For when the apostle says, Behold, here are two swords, Luke twenty two thirty eight. That is to say, in the church, since the apostles were speaking, the Lord did not reply that there were too many, but sufficient. <laughs> and they didn't even bother to explain. You know what? They quote scripture like Rick Warren. This is like reading the Purpose Driven Life. It, you have you, the, the text is so far removed from what's going on. I remember this verse about, behold, there are two swords. It's a great little verse. It's when Jesus, Jesus basically tells them that they're going to get killed. And so they should be ready for it. And he uses a metaphor about having a sword. And so they're like, oh, here's two swords. we got swords. He's like, that's, that's not what I'm talking about. That's enough. Okay, fine. Let's go to Garden Gethsemane. I'm going to die now. Guess I'm done talking to you guys. Right? And that was it. Like, it's it's a nonsense phrase as they say mm-hmm. it. And now they've doubled the nonsense by trying to turn it into, talk about allegory. Oh, I know. I know. So it, they continue. Yeah. Certainly the one who denies that the temporal sword is in the power of Peter has not listened well to the word of the Lord commanding, put up thy sword into thy scabbard, Matthew 26. Which is, stop cutting people's <laughs> ears off, Peter. I'm going to go die now. Oh, yeah. Right? But that actually means that go ahead and kill anybody you I, want. Yeah, after I know. I'm- Jesus says, who, if you live by the sword, you will die by the sword. Right there to Peter. Oh, my goodness. Uh, Both, therefore, are in the power of the church, that is to say, the spiritual and the material sword, but the former is to be administered for the church, but the latter by the church, the former in the hands of the priests, the latter by the hands of kings and soldiers, but at the will and the sufferance of the priest. There you go. Right. So so basically, the Pope isn't necessarily supposed to have have his own army, but hey, king, your army is the mm-hmm. Pope's army. And so you submit to the Pope, he crowns you, right? You got that from the Middle Ages stuff, the battles going on there. Wait, who's really in charge, King or Pope? And that, that's some of where this is coming out of, right? They're, they're basically continuing to affirm that they are over the emperor. That's that's the goal of this mm-hmm. era, mm-hmm. right? And it's going to be Sorry. continued in the next paragraph, which is a long one. I think we can skip most of it and get down. So we got the both swords. So the authority, all authority, by divine right, that's the first argument. The second one is to possess both swords. And then the third argument is that it's necessary for these things. It's necessary for salvation to believe these things. And you say, now, surely, surely the Catholic Church doesn't say that. Well, here is just the words, and let's see if we can sort out what they're getting at. Um, It says, therefore, whoever resists this power, that is the power of Peter, thus ordained by God, resists the ordinance of God, unless he invent, like like Manichius, two beginnings, which is false and judged by us heretical, since according to the testimony of Moses, it is not in the beginning, in the beginnings, but in the beginning that God created heaven and the earth. That's neither here nor there. Then this sentence. Furthermore, we declare, we proclaim, we define that it is absolutely necessary for salvation that every human creature be subject to the Roman pontiff. It's brutal. That is not an unclear sentence. No. (laughs) We declare, we proclaim, we define that it is absolutely necessary for salvation that every human creature be subject to the Roman pontiff. That's the papal doctrine. And when people read that, they're like, wait a minute, that's Antichrist. (laughs) Well, yeah. Yeah. At the very least, it's anti Christian. It is to to define define salvation as through the Pope. Mm -hmm. There is one mediator between Jesus Christ and man. He is right. the Pope, right? He is the Papa of Rome. That's it. That's it. It's madness. But they're not done. Yeah, it's crazy. No, I'm of Florence. What? Yeah. So, oh, I mean, this is so. This Council of Florence, for, fourteen thirty nine, comes later. Um, oh, I don't want to read all this stuff, that, but uh, let's see. No, um, but give us the highlights. Give us the Vatican yeah, One. They we, reaffirm this as well. If the if the bowl isn't enough, Vatican One's like dogma. Now you're in dogma. Yeah, right. this well, so, so, so Council of Florence says we def- and, and the Council of Florence is important because it's going to be quoted by Vatican I and by the, Cath- uh, the Catechism of the Catholic Church. It says, we define that the Holy Apostolic See and the Roman Pontiff holds the primacy over the whole world 
and that the Roman pontiff is the successor of blessed Peter, prince of the apostles, and that he is the true vicar of Christ, the head of the whole church, and the father and the teacher of all Christians. And to him was committed in blessed Peter the full power of tending, ruling, and governing the whole church, as is contained also in the Acts of the Ecumenical Councils and the Sacred Canons. Hmm. Let me so this goes back to the back to the two heads thing. Just remember that you know you can't have two heads without it being a monster, and so they're they're being very clear. Peter's the head. Peter. They just said mm -hmm. it. Right? Peter's, Peter's the, the head. head. It's not two heads. It's not Jesus and Peter. Just Peter. Sola popa. That's the sola of the Catholic Church. Pope alone. Yeah, I'm I'm going to read it again too. So so Peter, Prince of the Apostles, the head of the whole church. Okay. Now. You, you Christian, are like that doesn't jive with the Bible, right? And when you say that to a Roman Catholic, they're going to say yes, but you can't understand the Bible unless the Pope tells you how to understand it. So you're just misunderstanding it. Which I think that's a circular argument. Mm -hmm. But our point is less than to try to convince the naysayer, who would be the, the papist at this point, uh, and instead to say this is more than just false teaching. This is more than just a little leaven here. We're, we're on the we're on the verge of ultimate heresy, unforgivable sin, really, at a certain level. Um, before we get to that, though, because you know, what is Antichrist, right? Uh, and I'm not saying it's unforgivable sin to believe, to be a Roman Catholic, but it's unforgivable sin to be the guy saying this and believe it <laughs> about yourself. Um, Vatican I, does this just stand yeah, the yeah. cell? Hey, how about this? So it says, um, hmm, here's part, uh, this is the Vatican I, session four. Uh, this is So this is 1870. Uh, in order that the Episcopal the Episcopal office should be one and undivided, and that by union of the clergy, the whole multitude of believers should be held together in the unity of faith and communion. So here so you got this you got the preface to the idea that there would be a unity of faith and there'd be a unity of the church. He, that is Jesus, set blessed Peter over the rest of the apostles and instituted in him the permanent principle of both unities and and their visible foundation, so that the Pope is the permanent principle of the unity of faith, of the communion of the Church, and he is the visible foundation of the Church. This is amazing. I mean, Peter says the Church is built, uh, the, the Church is, the, is built up on the foundation of the prophets and the apostles with Jesus Christ himself as the chief cornerstone. And yet, who's the, who is the visible foundation of the Church here? It's Peter. It goes on to say, upon the strength of this foundation, Peter was to be built the eternal temple, and at and the church whose topmost part reaches heaven was to rise upon the firmness of this foundation. Unbelievable. It says later, uh, in this way, by the unity of the Roman pontiff, the church of Christ becomes one flock under one supreme shepherd. All caps on Supreme Shepherd. Not sure who they're referring to, honestly. Yeah. Jesus right. or him. Yeah. That's right. Uh, and I think they mean both. I mean, to, to, to best construction, the doctrine of the Antichrist, I don't think that they mean that Jesus isn't over them somewhere, somehow. I think they mean that this is how Jesus is working through this one guy. It's just weird that you would replace God working through this one guy, Jesus, with Jesus working through this one guy who dies, right? regularly and often. Now, the Vatican goes on. There's quite a bit more there. Catechism well, of the Catholic so Church. It, this is a, this is where the it's in Vatican one that we get the doctrine of ex cathedra. And so we can go down to, let me just pull this out here. So we got it. The official, this is, um, I can't remember from the chair. Yeah. Ex cathedra. This is where they make a pronouncement that is doctrine. So not every time the Pope speaks, is he infallible? It's only when he sits in the chair Ask cathedral that he's mm -hmm. it says faithfully i'm in, i think chapter four paragraph nine but i don't know what session it is but therefore faithfully adhering to the tradition received from the beginning of the christian faith to the glory of god our savior for the exaltation of the catholic religion and for the salvation of the christian people with the approval of the sacred council we teach and define as a divinely revealed dogma that when the roman pontiff speaks ex cathedra that is when in the exercise of his office as shepherd and teacher of all christians in virtue of his supreme apostolic authority, he defines a doctrine concerning faith or morals to be held by the whole church. He possesses, by the divine assistance promised to him in blessed Peter, 
that infallibility which the divine Redeemer willed his church to enjoy in defining doctrine concerning faith or morals. Therefore, such definitions of the Roman pontiff are of themselves, and not by the consent of the church, irreformable. Should then anyone, which God forbid, have the temerity to reject this definition of ours, let him be anathema. Right. So I, I want to I talk about this rather than just read it now. We, we've, had a, we've had a lot of uh, the same thing. The Catechism of the Catholic Church is going to say the same thing. Vatican II is going to say the same thing. So it, it keeps getting repeated. And it was it was clearly stated just there that this can never be repealed, that by definition, the Pope is a living prophet. He doesn't act alone, but without him, you have no access to God. That is the central article of the Roman Catholic Church. So you think, my, my friend's just Catholic. Well, or, or my wife's Catholic, I'm going to become Catholic. It's the same thing. Well, no, it's not. I mean, not if you believe words mean anything, if you believe church means anything. If it's all just randomly us getting close to God as close as we can get, yeah, you're probably right, but then that's not Christianity. The the other thing, uh, Brian, that that um, gets me here is while this is so audacious, it's not so far removed from me and my Bible. Uh, how is God leading me today? It's it's not so far removed from living prophecy, and the the antidote in the middle of all this of Scripture alone, which Protestants claim to have, but but don't actually believe in. I don't know if you want to go there either, but we're going to talk Antichrist. I mean, the spirit of the Antichrist is more than one man. The fact that one man, though, has managed to attain such a powerful position as the spirit of the Antichrist, that is a that is a truly terrifying thing. Yeah. No, you're right about that. It's um, There's this brilliant paragraph from Luther. I can't remember if we talked about it here in this context, but it's in Small Called Articles, Part 3, Paragraph <laughs> It's in section eight on confession, and it's where he unfolds the doctrine of enthusiasm. And he says enthusiasm is not just excitement. It's a it's a technical term, and it refers to the authority of our own heart. It, it, It means that God it means that the word is found on the inside, not on the outside. So the opposite of enthusiasm is the external word, sola scriptura, the authority of the scripture. But. The devil wants us to have the authority of our own think, thinking, of our own feeling. We want enthusiasm to be in, inside of us. And it's the mark of American Christianity, enthusiasm, that that I, I have this authority on my heart that confirms what the Word is saying. Probably goes back to Calvin, but it's it's manifested. You see it especially in Pentecostal churches, but any sort of evangelical churches, light charismatic churches, um, and so forth. The, the authority is on the heart. Now, Luther says... The Pope also is sheer enthusiasm because God speaks his authoritative word in the in the shrine of the Pope's heart. So, so the Catholic Church and the Pentecostal Church are the same. It's just the Catholics have only one Pentecostal. <laughs> it's the Pope. Yeah. And everyone has to listen yeah. to him. Whereas the in the in the Pentecostal Church, everyone is a Pope. But it's the same, it's the same problem. It's the it's the devil leading us away from the external word to the internal word that's happening in the chamber of our own heart. You got me thinking there about another one of the things from this conversation was uh, Our Lady of Ant- uh, Fatima. I wrote I wrote down Antifa. No, that would be that'd be a different group than Fatima. <laughs> um, Our Lady of Fatima and the prophecies and all this other stuff. I I, I got to find someone who knows about that to ask him about it. Um, all right, so. So the Lutherans were seeing all of this in the 500s, and they were seeing the exercise of the sword, the temporal sword, against them to compel them to submit to this man and his claim to be the only head of the church and the only way to God. And they said, hmm, sounds like something described in in Paul's letter to the Thessalonians. (laughs) So, so in, in the treatise on the power and the primacy of, pro, of the Pope, paragraph 39, Melanchthon says this. He says, it's well known, however, that the Roman pontiffs and their minions, I love how they refer to them minions, minions defend, <laughs> defend ungodly minions. doctrines and worship practices. <laughs> moreover, yeah, exactly. The marks, moreover, the marks of the Antichrist clearly fit the reign of the Pope. For describing the Antichrist to the Thessalonians, and we talked about this, like man of lawlessness is the language there, right? So there's a there's a slight 
biblical discrepancy in in uh, terminology or, or edges to these words. But describing the Antichrist to the Thessalonians, Paul calls him, the man of lawlessness, an adversary of Christ who, quote, this is Thessalonians, exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, declaring himself to be God. Melanchthon continues, he is speaking, therefore, of someone reigning in the church, not of pagan rulers, right? So this idea that the Antichrist is this guy over in the UN who has nothing to do with Christianity, that's just, that's wrong, right? When Antichrist works, he's in the church visibly and calls that one adversary of Christ, uh, the adversary of Christ, because he will invent doctrine that conflicts with the gospel and will ar arrogate to himself to find authority. That's exactly what we just read about happening. The Pope clearly reigns in the church, has established dominion for himself. The papal teachings contradict the gospel on numerous points. He assumes the right to alter Christ's teaching on worship instituted by God. He wants his own doctrine and worship to be regarded as divine. He claims not only the power to loose and bind in this life, but also the authority over souls after this life. The Pope is not willing to be judged by the church or anyone else and places his authority above the judgment of councils. To refuse to be judged by the church or anyone else is to make himself. God. Finally, he defends those dreadful errors and wickedness with the greatest savagery by killing those who dissent. And it's like, okay, well, the Pope's not killing anybody today. Not yet, at least. Um, Francis is supposed to be nice. Maybe, maybe, maybe. <laughs> um, he's nice right now because he's, he's weak. But the Lutherans of the Reformation era were being killed for the sake of this very teaching. Are we just are we just holding on too hard, Pastor Wolf Mueller? Aren't we past all this by now? <laughs> it's right. the Pope is getting worse. I mean, that's a problem. Is I mean, he might be getting nicer, but that's part of the game, you know. If you look at his his sheep clothing is getting sheepier, <laughs> but that doesn't. He's sharpening his claws at the same time. I mean, how much how much more do we have to learn about the destruction that the Catholic Church has done to say, hey, something not right is happening over here? And it's not happening. It, it's manifesting itself. Now, okay, so, so there are a couple of ironies um, to look at here. Because the first one is, ironically enough, when Luther, for example, was writing the large catechism, which was in large part to say how the world should be ordered, he was writing it against the Pope, who had totally disordered the world with his despising of family and work by the monasteries and all this other nonsense. Nowadays, if we want to find someone to talk about marriage and family and the sanctity of human life and the value of children in the womb, for example, like the only people are around are the, are the, the Catholics, the Roman Catholics, right. which is a right. weird sort of thing. I mean, it just shows how bad the rest of the world has gotten is that they're our closest friends on this. But so they are, and we should... We should thank God for that. We should thank God that the that the Catholic Church still knows how to talk about not killing babies. And we should thank God that the Catholic Church still knows how to talk at least halfway helpfully about marriage, or at least they still think that there is a such thing as marriage and so forth. Yeah, for the moment. Depends on who's in charge and how far That's they go right. in the next 20 years. Okay. Yeah, but So yeah, we yeah. should thank God for that, that it, that it hasn't totally fallen. But we see that in, in the Catholic Church, I mean, there's a, there is a... Um, there's a rottenness that goes all the way down. It's just, it, it's all the way down to the root, and it's because they do not understand the righteousness of faith. They don't understand the gospel. They don't understand the, the doctrine of, of the forgiveness of sins. They, they, they can't get there. Um, and that is bad. We have a, a young lady that uh, I just just affirmed her in faith uh, into the church yesterday. She's a, a converted Roman Catholic. She's going to get married in the fall. Nice young lady. And we were talking about like how she is engaging with her largely Catholic family and community that she is now not going to church with anymore. And she said, I just keep telling them about how I'm, I'm actually saved. It's just amazing to me. Like that, I, that I don't have to worry about it. Like he actually saved me. And it's just like such a neat thing to see, but it's also so, so terrifyingly sad she was a good Catholic. She was a good Catholic and the good Catholic cannot believe they're saved. Right. They must continue to submit to the Pope and earn that path, earn, earn the way in. It's, it's, it's such a blight on the conscience. It's, it's, it, the, the old Lutherans used to, they called it the monster of uncertainty and it's Catholic dogma. Hey, you say something, I'm going to grab my Trent off the shelf. 
Well, okay. The other thing I was going to say, well, I got a question for you. So I'm going to, I'm going to read uh, the rest of the treatise that we have here in, in paragraphs 57 to 59, Melanchthon takes the gloves off. And, and this is sort of now we got another 20 minutes here. What we really want to talk about in general was how do we embrace this terminology? How do we believe it firmly? How do we speak it without sounding like we're crazy? So he says, even if the Roman pontiff did possess primacy by divine right, that is, even if God did say, hey, Peter and your successors, everyone's supposed to listen to you. Even then, continuing, obedience is still not owed to him if he and when he defends ungodly worship and teaching contrary to the gospel. So even if God did say, hey, Peter, you and your those who are after you are in charge of the church, the moment they would be like, oh, and Jesus is not the only way to heaven, um, well, then now they're no longer in charge of the church. They, they cannot overturn doctrine. It would then be indeed necessary to oppose him as the Antichrist. That's it. That's where we are. The errors of the Pope, he says, are blatant and they are not trivial. That is, we haven't passed these away. They're not gone. They're still here. The cruelty he inflicts on godly persons is also manifest. That may not be as much, although if Benedict really was pushed out, I mean, that, that's a thing right there, um, even, even though he's, he's in the seat himself. The ungodly teaching, the unjust violence. Therefore, all of the godly have a good, compelling, clear reason not to submit to the Pope. These reasons console them in the face of the reproaches of causing scandal, schism, discord. Truly, those who agree with the Pope and defend his teaching and worship practice and practices defile themselves with idolatry and blasphemous opinions, making themselves guilty of the blood of godly people whom the pers whom the Pope persecutes, offend against the glory of God, and undermine the well-being of the church, because they confirm errors and other disgraces for posterity. Um, okay, so so long and short, there was no question in the minds of the 1580 Lutherans, the 1530 Lutherans, the 1620 Lutherans, the 1750 Lutherans, the 1890 Lutherans, the 1910 no, Lutherans, yeah. maybe less so. Um, no question. The Pope is the Antichrist. We must, uh, on, on, uh, on jeopardy of our Christianity, oppose right. him at yeah. all odds and oppose the Roman Catholic Church, not, not tradition, but the actual Roman yeah. Catholic Church and its false teaching at all odds and must be vocally uh direct about this now my friend we here, don't so do here's that a, he, here's the thing i mean so we 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 are in this deadly situation of of like of being nice because of ignorance it's like um it's because it's hard to say the pope is the antichrist if you don't know what the pope says if you just like look at that, like, how can you be so mean to that person? Well, the the reason why the Lutherans could say the Pope was the Antichrist is because they respected him enough to listen and take seriously what he said. So we we have this idea of the, like you can be nice if you just if you just if you don't take people seriously if you don't. If you don't care, it's we do. We can do the same thing with Islam. Like you can be nice to the Islamists if you don't take them seriously enough to actually read what they say. But if you if you if you give them the respect of listening to them, then you have to come to some hard conclusions about what's really going on. And the same thing is true with the Pope. If you give the Pope the respect that he's asking for by listening to what he says, then you have to come to a conclusion about about the deadliness of his doctrine. I, I pulled off the shelf of the Council of Trent. You want some of this? Yeah, <laughs> sure. Okay, this is session four, I think, when they really go after the Lutherans. Or maybe I should say, when they really go after the Bible. Here's Canon 9. If anyone says that by faith alone the impious is justified, in such a way as to mean that nothing else is required to cooperate in order to the obtaining the grace of justification, and that it is not in any way necessary that he be prepared and disposed by the movement of his own will, let him be anathema. Canon 11. Hmm. If anyone says that men are justified either by the sole imputation of the righteousness of Christ or by the sole remission of sins, to the exclusion of the grace and the love which is poured forth in their hearts by the Holy Spirit and is inherent in them, or even that the grace whereby we are justified is only the favor of God, let him be anathema. Canon 12. Yeah. If, if, it, yeah. if anybody confessed the Book of Concord of 1580, let him be anathema. I mean, this is right. what they're saying. If, 
if anyone's a Protestant and believes in justification by grace alone through faith alone, I mean, there was a lot of big yeah. language thrown in there, but there, if, if you have any desire to believe in yeah. grace alone, you're here's, anathema. Here, here's 12. Anathema. If anyone says that justifying faith is nothing but confidence in divine mercy, which forgives sins for Christ's sake— or that this confidence alone is that by which we are justified, let him be anathema. And then, how about this? You were talking about the uncertainty and the doubt. Here's Canon 16. If anyone says that he will certainly, with an absolute and unfallible certainty, have the great gift of perseverance unto the end, unless he has learned this by special revelation, let him be anathema. In other words, you can't know that you're saved. You can't know that your sins are forgiven. Yeah unless the Holy Spirit has given you some sort of special saintly revelation. I had to throw that, that, that saintly part in at the back end because of Job, because otherwise they'd be condemning Job, right? I know my, dele- my, my Redeemer lives. I'll look upon him in the land of the living. You know, it, it's just, so what they've done, interestingly, so they, they tied two things to what you must add to Jesus' work in order to be saved in, in those statements. They tied a decision of your will, which is just like all you decision theologists out there, all your Arminians, you Baptists. I, I love you guys, but uh, you're just like the Catholics. <laughs> exactly like the Catholics on the doctrine of the will. And faith made active through love, that it's how you how you enact the love, how your sanctified response to what Jesus does embraces and fulfills grace in your present day. So it is it is willpower and works at the end of the day, that must also justify, which is why they're not against justification by faith, but it's about the faith alone issue that they're getting at. So again, back on the meanness, I mean, how can we even be heard saying this? Because the ignorance, which you talked about, is the dominant reality. And if you say where we started off, if you say the Pope is the Antichrist, that ignorance will say, one, I've never heard him say something like, I want to take over the world with, with our armies and tanks, even though he has tried. Um, and, and they will say, um, he's such a nice old man. That's like saying the Dalai Lama is a hit, is, is a Nazi or something crazy like that. Why would you say that? It is effectively that, right? To say the Dalai Lama is a Nazi is to say the Pope <laughs> is the Antichrist. They're like on the same level, right? Yeah. So you said to me recently that you and I have a particular task in life, which is to make clear what has been unclear. And this is this is exactly it. I don't know how to do it. Maybe man of lawlessness is actually the way to do it. Stop saying antichrist and stop saying man of lawlessness because it doesn't have the baggage. I don't know. But but how do we make this clear? And also in that way, convince look, the the, the people listening to this podcast are pretty committed Christians. Like they're not going to be like, this is crazy talk, I'm out of here. Right. But I'm thinking about the the the, the modestly committed right. Christian, right? H- how do we win them to this? I'm thinking about there's another young man who I know around the area here. Good young man, probably one of the more committed youth group attendees of his generation. Still knows his doctrine. Married Catholic now is a Catholic. No big deal. I still believe yeah. what I believe. Well, you probably do, except for that. You're communing from the hand of the Antichrist, right? But I can't just say that to him. That I told happen. I told my friend Father Angel, um, he was he was ordained like two weeks before I was down the street, and now he he teaches at the seminary. He went and got a couple of PhDs from Rome, and now he's in town. And uh, I remember we were talking about this, how the Lutherans say the Pope's the Antichrist, and and he says, "Oh, come on now." And I so I told him when we were electing some previous Pope that he should get elected, and then when he's Pope, he should take the name. Pope Martin Luther the first. <laughs> and he said, oh, right, I'm pretty sure the Roman Catholics and the Lutherans wouldn't understand that, which was right. He said, well, it's better than Pope Antichrist the 275th or whatever. Yeah. But, oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, shit. But he's, but, but so, I mean, it, it does. I mean, it does. I think that's the point. It does sound mean. But what if we said, I mean, what if you said, well, the Pope is the anti gospel, the Pope is anti forgiveness. Mm-hmm. The, the Pope is anti-faith. The Pope is anti-certainty. The Pope is anti... He, he's anti-salvation by grace. That means he's anti-Christ. Well, maybe that doesn't strike, Where so I, it doesn't have this, like, anti-Christ has this idea, like, the, you know, the horns and the or whatever. You know? Right, right. It also calls up the thing. So if the Pope is the anti-Christ, you must therefore be saying that Roman Catholics right. are all going to hell. Because the Antichrist rules over hell, right, or something like that, and so you know you're just you're just condemning an entire 
group of Christians. And well, that's and not, not right either. But we, so, how do we think of false? This is so we have this idea just on the on the topic of how to how to handle false doctrine. We have the idea that either it if it's false doctrine, it has to damn you, or it has to not matter at all. <laughs> like those are the two options. So I say, well, can someone be a Christian and be Roman Catholic? We say, well, yeah, it's possible. It's possible. You say, well, so then it doesn't matter. Well, yeah, it matters. It's like, it's like. I, so I think the picture is something like cancer, or I, I mean, cancer would be the best. It's like, well, can, can I be alive? Yeah, you cancer? can be. And so you're like, well, yeah. so then cancer doesn't matter. Well, no, it matters because number one, it's going to wreck you, your life now, and number two, eventually, it's going to kill you if it gets if you just let it loose and you don't treat it. So that false doctrine is like cancer. You can you can saving faith can live while you hold on to false doctrine, but the but but. But like cancer and life, so false doctrine and salvation are going to be fighting against each other. So you don't want to just say, oh, well, it's fine. It's, can you imagine? Oh, I'm Catholic, but I'm still Christian. Don't worry about me. It's like, I'm, I've got cancer, but I'm still alive. Don't worry about me. No, compassion would actually have us worry about the false doctrine. Because every the reason why the devil implants false doctrine into us, like a disease, is to eventually kill our faith. Every heresy strikes Christ. That's how Luther said it. And that's right. Yeah. Can you can you drink poison and live? And especially if it's a slow poison and it only kills you over time. And and don't worry about me, I'm just gonna drink a little more poison. I mean the answer is no, don't drink the poison. Instead, remove the poison and then you will be healthy, right? And you will have the fullness. Okay, so I I, I on this I'm I'm confessed. Go ahead, go ahead. So we we're starting to see a lot of evangelicals come out of evangelicalism and into the Lutheran doctrine, and, and this and go to well, Rome. that's bad. But but, but when Rome. they when they come to the Lutheran church, they have this great joy, and they're like, and they say to the Lutherans, "Hey, how come you what? How come you guys didn't tell us all this stuff before?" Now, I think that's going to start happening with Catholics too. That more and more are going to be coming out of Rome into the into the Lutheran church, and they're gonna and they're going to be the ones who are going to be leading the charge. Like, hey, we need to. There's a lot of people over there under the Pope, under his tyranny, who don't know, who don't know the the certainty of salvation. They don't know the doctrine of faith. They don't know the confidence that we have in Christ. They don't know the forgiveness of sins. We need to speak more clearly and more loudly to them so that they can share in our joy. And that's the idea. So it's not a fight. When we look at someone who has false doctrine, it's not. We don't get. We're, it's not mad. There's a, there might be a sadness to it, because they don't they're not rejoicing in all of the great gifts that that Jesus wants them to have and that is that's a yeah. that's the tragedy the only one I get mad at is the false teacher who believes it he, he tends to make me or she tends to really get me angry but the the person who believes it no yeah you're right sheep led astray sheep without a shepherd so okay so because right, I have these two different thoughts here and they're both really different directions you mentioned like the idea of people coming out of Roman Catholicism. And I, I, I go back to this conversation with this guy who's like, yeah, I'm a Catholic. Yeah. I believe in the Pope. No, that's not the Pope. And it's like, okay, so like, how does this work out for you on a world stage? You Latin mass trad Catholics are the smallest group in Roman Catholicism, right? You don't have, in, you're not in charge of anything. So the likelihood, I know you might like to think that, you know, God works wonders and you're just going to be back in charge, but you know, I'll tell you how it went when we were there, right? They kicked us out. So what do you do when you're a Catholic that gets kicked out of the Catholic church and your, your whole doctrine is about being the Catholic mm -hmm. church. Now you begin to say that you're the Catholic church in exile. You have the real, I mean, this, they went through this. When was this? It was 1700s, the French guy. Oh, I mean, yeah. they went yeah. through this. Once before, right? I just I find that really interesting. But I, I, what worries me is you're going to see Catholics leaving the Catholic Church to become weird other smaller Catholics. I, I don't know. I and we can't foretell uh, what kind of um, gathering the Lord will do to remove people from heterodoxy in, in this current era. But I, I'm not convinced that we're positioned to receive them because, again, this guy I was chatting with, he was an evangelical. That was his, he cut his teeth and, and a, a diehard evangelical. And then when he gets tired of the evident false teaching of the evangelicals and the discrepancies of their teaching, the diversity of their teaching, he wants the unity that the Catholic church provides. <laughs> right. Uh, and, and so that's where he goes. He jumps right over Wittenberg, goes yeah. right past us. 
And we are, where are we? We're not in that mix. We're not even on the, on the, in the conversation about, uh, you mentioned one of the things you've been talking about recently is, is public theologians there. And you, you talk about the law gospel, public theologian. That's great. But I mean, there is no Lutheran public yeah. theologian, not, not at the level of any of these other guys in these conversations that are taking place, which position them publicly in the public eye to be seen and known. That's, that's a problem. I don't, I don't know that there's a fix. Uh, it certainly means I'll throw it back at you. It certainly means we have to believe yeah, what we right. actually believe. It's, so these guys, these guys that hundred years ago, 200 years ago, 300 years ago, were like, nope, Pope's the antichrist. We probably need to get back to a point where we're not ashamed yeah, right. of that. And this is something that I talked about last week. It came out of, uh, um, Adam Kuntz. It was, it was his stuff, but that our strategy has become mm-hmm. appeasement. And appeasement is not a strategy for no, any kind of victory. No, that's ever. right. Especially when your enemy is the devourer. It's, he's never going to be satisfied. <laughs> It's just like you throw him, you throw him a steak and he eats it and he wants more and more and more and he will never be satisfied. So the appeasement, it it can't win. That's I mean, I was telling you about these conversations that I had with Father Angel and we both appreciated them because he was really Catholic and I was really Lutheran and you knew where the other person stood. We tried to have this conference one time where it was going to be like an Episcopalian lady and me and him and then a couple other people and the, we we were asking everyone to talk about the different doctrines of their different churches, and the problem is that nobody else actually knew what the doctrine was and didn't even care. So that there's a there's something better. If I if there's a risk, it's hard to imagine. But when we call when we call the Pope the Antichrist, we're respecting him more than the people who do not. <laughs> That's because we we're at least taking him seriously. We're you know, we're at least listening to what he says. Yeah, yeah, I do. I'm thinking about that, and and, and it, it's again, we did, uh, the hang up is yeah, on the word yeah. antichrist, and it just it it. But then, see, I'm trying to appease. Yeah, I'm trying to find, uh, or is, or am I just trying to translate? Well, I don't. We, we always so, if we want to say, well, people are. Um, there's other people who are worse than the Pope, like Mohammed. <laughs> And then this is where this great Luther wrote this. But he's yeah, not right. Luther wrote this war against the Turkey. He says, the Pope is the very Antichrist and Muhammad is the devil incarnate. <laughs> so it's not like it's not like you can. It's like because we call the Pope the Antichrist, we don't have anything bad to say about anybody else. <laughs> this is really important. This is really important, though. So I mentioned the Dalai Lama earlier, who I do believe teaches falsely, teaches paganism, teaches hellfire and brimstone, taking you there doctrine. But he's right. not the Antichrist. He's, because he doesn't claim to be a Christian or take right. a seat in the that's church. It. And that's going to be the key thing that the that the that this p- treatise on the power and primacy of the Pope is going to pull out for us, is that the, he presents himself, uh, he exalts himself above God in the temple of God. That's the that's the, the mark of the, the man of lawlessness here. But listen to what it says. This is 2 Thessalonians 2.8. It says, And the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming. So that this kingdom of Antichrist which presents itself as this huge, big, monstrous thing. It's just, Jesus just, he, he blows it over, like the, you just with a, with, a, with a whisper, with a puff. Whew, he, no, he knocks the whole kingdom of Antichrist over so that it's, a, it's an illusion, it's a spectacle, but it's not reality. And, and the thing for us to remember is that the thing that is real is the thing that's established by the mouth of Jesus, by the words of Jesus. Baptism, his body and blood for the forgiveness of sins, the absolution, his setting us in, in this world to love and serve our neighbor. These are real and true things, and because God's word is attached to them, they are eternal things. They're immortal things. And so there needs to be no there needs to be no intimidation. And maybe this is back to what you're talking about. There also needs to be no shame. One of the things that the devil does, we got to, and I'm guilty of this, of this temptation. This is from Psalm two, where David says, "How long will you turn my glory into shame?" The devil always wants to make us ashamed of the things that we should be proud about. So we know that a man is a man and a woman is a woman. That's not that's that's not something to be ashamed of. We know that marriage is a is a man and a woman. We we know that that the Pope opposes the gospel, that he's antichrist. We know the, and we should not be ashamed of these things, but the devil always wants us to be ashamed uh, of this and to try to whisper it and to not and to not speak it loudly. But we we fight back against the devil when we glory in the truth that the Lord reveals to us in the scriptures. 
when I get tempted to want to be Roman Catholic, and it never is to actually be a Roman Catholic, I just want the money that they have, not for me, but like the church, they have, they have buildings, they have money, they have attendance numbers. They're just, they're, they're just massive. They have liturgy. They have a, a belief in their history being valuable. Those are the things that, that I am drawn to. And what all of it plays on is the current weakness, the current pathetic state of Lutheranism, right? As this joke of a church on the national stage and the international stage, a joke of a church that, that we are so minuscule. We think we're so big. We're, we're fighting over scraps and corners. Nobody even knows we're here. Nobody even knows what our name means. We have this ridiculous name from a guy. I like Luther just fine, but ultimately I'm not a, a Lutheran like that. I am not a, a follower of Dr. Martin Luther. Uh, I, I subscribe to the same gospel that he and all the Christian church on earth subscribes to. But we're, we're stuck battling for like identity politics of Lutheranism while we completely destroy ourselves by abandoning the doctrine that would, that would actually make us be Lutheran if there is such a thing. And it, when, it, when, I, when I feel that, when my systemic, you know, wide ranging, the way I look at big picture things, mind sees that, I just, I despair, man. Because then it's like the, this Antichrist, he's got it all. But see, then, then I remember the theology. Yeah, that's exactly right. That's what the Antichrist does is he's got it all. He looks like the church and you don't look like the church, at least except for the fact that you have the bread and the wine given freely for forgiveness with no strings attached. And the, wa- and the washing of regeneration. You got that. That's all you got. Mm-hmm. Oh, wait, that's the church. Not all the other stuff I mentioned before. It, it's, the, yeah. it's always this. So, so here's, the, here's, the, here's the imagination game to play. Is just, just say you're a stranger and you walk into this old kind of town one day, oh, a couple thousand years ago, and there's this ruckus. And so you go and you see at the courthouse and there's two guys that are there. One's a Roman who is ruling the place, and he's got a beautiful wife who's there by his side, and he sits on this throne, and he's got golden rings and a golden staff, and he's decked out with this glory. He's got soldiers at his command. The whole town is coming to him, asking him for things because he is in charge. He's got this big mansion and palace behind him. He's well-educated. His kids are running around. They'll be rulers too someday. And in front of him is this beat-up fellow with co- covered in in spit half of his beard torn out with with a with a crown of thorns and and this old dirty blood soaked purple robe he's barefoot his knees are skinned everybody hates him there's people who who you thought would love him and they're running away from him and you see them at the back of the crowd they're cowering and, and this rich, wealthy fellow points to him and says, behold the man, and everyone cries out that he should be crucified. So yeah, you have these two men standing there. One's Pilate and one is Jesus. So you've got no idea who they are. And someone says, you got to follow one of those guys. Who are you going to follow? <laughs> and we, everything in us says, I'm going to follow Pilate. Pilate, that's your best life now. That's That's the... That's the that's the flesh. That's the way that our minds want to go. That's the way that our bodies want to go. That's the that's the thing that we're drawn to, and that's what the Pope has. I mean, he's he he literally has the, the Caesar's throne. He's got a, the biggest palace in the world, the biggest church ever. You, he's got the finest art collections. He's got all of the stuff, except for the blood of Jesus. And the forgiveness of sins, the treasure, the most valuable thing on earth looks like the weakest and lowliest thing of all. And that's how the Lord works. He hides his treasure in these clay jars, in these weak, we're in the in the suffering and the death of Jesus. And so we, we're always fighting this temptation to stand with Pilate or to stand with Rome rather than to 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 rejoice in the in the care of Jesus, which is weak and despised and forsaken and it has to be and it always will be yeah it's the bread and wine it's bread and wine on sunday i i love this about the old lutherans in america that that's 
that's how they built their churches was for that. That's why they gathered. It's what held them together. There was an age that, that came about where the, we, we downplayed, we bronze aged would be the term. We, we, we downplayed the centrality of the supper in the life of the congregation, but that's not how it was when they were building these old buildings, glorious old buildings that we still do have. I, they were people who knew that whatever else was going on in that town, they were getting the body and blood of Jesus there and that that was enough. That was sufficient. And so today, wherever you are, whatever your congregation looks like, however many troubles and trials are going through, whatever you don't look like, whatever you think you should look like and you can't ever be, just just pause at the next divine service, right? And just look at the people walking up to take that bread and wine. Listen to the pastor's words when he says, this is, this is, this is. And remember, that's more it's more than all the Roman Catholic churches in the world so far as their their pomp and circumstance can give. And frankly, if you went to their church, they wouldn't necessarily give it to you. <laughs> they wouldn't let you drink from the and, cup. And so they, they would that, take you from you your own confidence. They'd say, you, you trust in Christ, yeah. you're anathema. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's awful. I... Well, when you dig into the doctrine of the Antichrist, don't expect a, a, a lifter upper. Although the uh, your, your bit there about uh, that was great, uh, Pilate and Jesus. That that was great as faith feeding. Um, uh, we have we'll turn a corner next time we come back with some more eschatology. But this this will wrap up our Antichrist talk for now. Hopefully, I, I was kind of wanting the only thing I wanted more of from you. I don't remember when you did this. You like you like gave me this conviction. And what, what, what was it about? It was in these conversations, and it, it must have been the Man of Lawless's conversation. You gave me this conviction from these these old Lutherans and old Methodists and old Presbyterians that like they were just all so gung ho about. Nope, there's only one answer to this question. <laughs> it's not a confusing text, and uh, uh, I feel like we didn't maybe do that enough today. Maybe we did. Maybe we'll we did. make up for it sometime. What do you think? <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> all right, cool. Yeah. Cool. So thank you for your time, Brian, and. Uh, I always, always love chatting. Eschatology is not over. We'll be back. Oh, geez, that sounded good in your ears. We'll be back uh, uh, with I can another. Hit my um, mic too. Oh, jeez, oh. <laughs> yeah, and my falling. I'm gonna tell everybody where we're going next. Uh, uh, actually, I'm gonna update two things. So, first off, after this, we're gonna come back with numbers, big numbers, little numbers, and the world is ending oh, cool. a few too many times. So, we'll be looking at all sorts of different types of things uh, with numbers in Revelation, particularly. Uh, yeah, it looks like mostly Revelation. And uh, if you if you're interested in and are those who have been purchasing the Thief in the Night series, which is the transcripts of these uh, these these episodes. I've put that on a temporary pause. I still want to come back to it, but I, I have a prayer book I've been working on, and I, I told myself I'm done working on self-publishing two side projects at the same time. So until I finish the prayer book, uh, I'm not going to be investing any more money uh, into the the Thief in the Night series. They have paid for themselves back, though just just barely. Um, so that's why that's on hiatus, but it's not gone. Those Those will come back. Was that worth a dollar? What about five? Project Resurrection is made possible by listeners like you and your patronage of my husband's work. Click the Patreon link in the show notes to sign up. Pretty please? <laughs>